seated. Oh, I love you. It's just so great to see you. So great to see you. I don't know if anybody who's been watching online is brand new and you signed up as a guest, but it sure is good to have you with us. My name is Brett. I am pastor of this people. And uh, this is the first time in the last 15 weeks we've been able to meet as a congregation. And I'm grateful to God for your faithfulness during the time when we could not. You watched, you participated, you served, you gave, you were engaged, you helped people, you were a part of small groups and Google Hangouts moments. You, uh, you worked with what you could you took the five loaves and you watched God multiply it for your benefit and for the benefit of others. Bless you. Thank you. And it's great to see you. Really, really great to see you. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we're going to um, look at a, at a book that, that is uh, somewhat difficult to read because it, it doesn't have a whole lot of pep to it. So turn with me over to the book of Lamentations book of Lamentations. <clears throat> and the title of the message tonight is a lament with hope. A lament with hope. We're going to look at Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 19 through 23. Lamentations 3, 19 through 23. Remember my affliction and my wandering the wormwood in my bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall, verse 21, to my mind. Therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. And great is your faithfulness. Lord, help us as we study. Jeremiah was recalling the pain of his soul and then he recalled the hope of his soul. How about we practice some things before I get into this? Um, I can hear you, but I can't see you. And though I have not had any cues for the last 15 weeks with respect to getting a response from you when I say something, because you're not there, you are here now, and I still don't know who you are. Okay, so um, you're going to have to, if you really want there to be a congregational moment like we normally have it, uh, say amen. amen. Do that more regularly. And because I can't see you smile, I have no idea what you're thinking about it. If it's not really funny, but it's pleasant, I can't see your, your emotions. So either wave your hands or do this. So we'll learn how to communicate with one another because we are an interactive congregation. It's not just coming to hear a talking head. The congregation is involved in the worship experience. And the way we do what we do is that we feed off one another. When there is a good moment, when all of us want to respond with an amen or a, a, a yes, pastor, that's great. It's not for me. I, again, I haven't had it for weeks and don't need it. But it is for all of us so that when people see us being, uni being in unity on a certain point, they go, oh, these people are together. And we all feel it together. We're experiencing something together. So it's a, it's a moment of worship with respect to agreement and saying, Lord, amen to what you're doing with us here. So I need some demonstrative moments from you. And so does everybody else here, okay? Sound good? There we go, there we go. <laughs> All right. So Jeremiah. Jeremiah is um, probably the most sad prophet in all of Scripture. Not only is he sad about the things he's got to say to his people, but he's in a sad position. And then nobody wants to listen to anything he's got to say. Yet what he's saying is true. It's the word of the Lord. And, and his, his life and ministry start off seemingly with a bang. I mean, the Lord tells him in Jeremiah 1, before I formed you in the womb, verse 4, I knew you. 
And before you were born, I consecrated you to be a prophet to the nations. Verse 9, 8 and 9. To uproot and to tear down, to build and to plant. What I tell you to speak, you will speak. What I tell you to say, you will say. Now, when you get that kind of a word, you're thinking, I am purposed. The Lord has treated me with great kindness. He's let me know that this isn't something I just desired to do when I came into an understanding of my own consciousness and calling. He, he's, fashion, he's fashioned me for this. Before, he, before I was even a thought in my mama's mind, he thought about me in her womb and I was supposed to be a prophet. I'm, I'm right in the middle. Now, when God said this in Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah responded with, I'm only a kid. Why are you, why are you calling me now? And he was a son of a priest named Hilkiah. And so you kind of think, you got the wrong generation. I mean, don't you want to talk to my daddy? He's really good. I mean, he's a good priest. He knows what he's doing. So Jeremiah was a PK. He was a preacher's kid. And the Lord had come down on the inside. Thank you very much for nodding, every one of you. It helps me. He came down on the inside. God came down on the inside and started talking to him about his calling now when he was a kid. He said, I am a youth. How can I bear this burden? He said, don't say you are a youth. For the stuff I put in your mouth, you will say. And where I send you, you will go. Now, that sounds like what a kid of destiny, right? And surely it's going to work out beautifully. Not so much. It worked out according to the will of God. But it was a very hard life for Jeremiah because all he had to say over and over and over was, Jerusalem, you're getting ready to get beat up. You've disobeyed for generations and the Lord is bringing discipline and the city is going to be destroyed and all of you are going to be taken captive. Now the people who understood the promises of God from the Torah and what God had done through the disciplining of his people prior, they always said, well, wait a minute now. I mean, we've been disciplined before, but sure enough, the Lord has always allowed us to be. This is the land that he has called us to inherit. This is the place he's called us to grow. Our grandfathers and their fathers and their fathers. It, I mean, Jeremiah, it's been a almost a thousand years of us being in this piece of property from Joshua. Surely, the Lord's not going to kick us out. He said this was our inheritance. And so they beat him up verbally, castigated him, made him a man of no repute in front of the people, called him a traitor, said, you're really on the side of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, aren't you? They're paying you, aren't you? You're trying to subvert all the loyalty that would be to the people here so that they would go there. And you're taking the heart away from folks that would fight for this nation because they don't believe God's with us anymore. So what's the point? If the Lord doesn't build the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Why should we work if God's not with us? Shut up! His entire ministry, from the time he was a kid to the time Jerusalem was taken. And we think that was somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 or 40 years. His entire ministry was one that was hard. And there were times when Je Jeremiah said, I ain't talking no more, Lord. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I, just, I don't want to talk. I don't want to. This is, really? They threw him in jail. They threw him in a cistern that had mud and all kind of junk in it, an old cistern, not a cistern that had water that was drinkable. A place where people, they, 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 they threw him in there for punishment. And let's just say that not only was the water foul, but the stuff they put in there was real bad. He had a horrible life. And then on top of that, God asked him to buy property one time. Buy property. When he knew that the Babylonians were coming. He said, buy this property, ask your uncle to get this piece of property, buy it from him, and it will be a sign that I'm going to bring the people back. And so they need to invest, and, and, and so buy it. Now, that was a good thing. Jeremiah said, you're coming back after a period of 70 years. That's a good thing. But Jeremiah wouldn't have the property. He'd be dead. So God told him, spend your money for stuff you'll never get back. I mean, this was flat hard for him his entire life. 
And then we get to this passage in Lamentations 3. And the entire book of Lamentations is Jeremiah now seeing what God brought to pass. He's there in Jerusalem. And the city is, is desolate. There's nothing left. Walls are broken down. Temple has been destroyed. People are gone. Folks have died. Probably mass graves because of the war and the besieging of the city. Horrible. And he not only describes the atmosphere in which he now lives, where everything he has said has come to pass, sadly. He then talks to God, or is talking to people about what God has done to him. And this is the book of Lamentations. It's not only recognizing what has happened as a result of the judgment of God upon Jerusalem, it's Jeremiah saying, this is what God did to me. He made me an oracle of judgment for the people. He laid heavy burdens on me, and it was hard. The entire book is one long lament. Lament means to grieve, to grieve. When I, when I think about the situation in which we find ourselves in America, where African Americans are trying to figure out how in the world to fully integrate into what we now know as the American freedoms which most people enjoy on a regular basis without cognizant thought. The dominant population just goes through life knowing that this is an opportunity where African Americans constantly f have to go through the idea of, I wonder if it could ever happen for me. I began to think about the tenor and the, the condition of the soul in which most African Americans live. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight. When we get to Sunday, we're going to put a comma on this entire idea about presenting from the front regarding the condition of our nation if the world doesn't fall apart tomorrow. If, if the sky doesn't fall between now and then, I can do a regular Father's Day message. <laughs> but I just need to inform you tonight so you understand the soul of an African American, not just the condition in which he lives. It'll help all of us, and it will help you who are black process better. It will help us understand what it means to live together better. Because I realize 98% of my life has been lived in grief. That's where I live. Now, those of you who have been with this congregation for a long period of time would say, you've got to be kidding me because you're, you're pretty positive. I mean, you're full of faith. You believe things can happen that can't happen. And, and you seem to be very optimistic about life. And you don't complain. And, and, and true. I love that I can be characterized as that. But the reason I live at those places, because I know it's biblically sound, Left to my own devices, grief would be a normal part of my life. I'm not talking about an anger that is unrestrained. Though grief can bleed into anger often and come out in ways that are unpleasant, many times unhelpful. And the African American sometimes doesn't know what to do with on the inside because of the blatant disrespect that he experiences on a regular basis. And it's not just that which he experiences in his own life, it's that which his parents have experienced. His grandparents have experienced. Their parents have experienced. And like Jeremiah, they look over the landscape of their, of their ethnic city and they see it destroyed in so many ways. When other people don't have any connection to what they're going through. And it's the, the pain of the soul with which we live regularly and we, we put a mask on. And it's not just to cover up. It's a mask of their therapeutic purposes. And that we, we can't live in pain every day. We can't let that guide our conduct and our mind and our lives because it's just not healthy. Anybody who's living through pain on a regular basis is sick. They're sick. They're hurt. The, 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 the stuff on the inside is killing their soul. It is drowning 
their well-being. We can't live like that. And so most white people, during the time of detente, when there aren't things going on, they think everything's fine, right? It's good. It's good. And black people are saying, no, it's not good. But if I were to talk about it, you couldn't hear it anyway. You really couldn't understand it. You don't understand my pain. And not only do I have, I live with pain, live with it, and learn how to manage it so that it doesn't just bleed out all the time and make people so uncomfortable that they never want to be around me. I brought it to the cross. I know what it means to leave stuff there and to pick up the joy of the Lord on a regular basis. And that, in combination with hope, I know what that means and I know how to do it with skill. And that's how I lead. But I feel this. My grandfather taught at Tuskegee Institute, which is an HBCU, historically black college and university, founded by Booker T. Washington to educate African Americans in the South because they could not attend white universities. And most of the HBCUs have struggled from the beginning. Fortunately, we do. They do get a lot of government assistance, but they still struggle. And Tuskegee was founded in Tuskegee, Alabama. My grandfather got his PhD from math, uh, in mathematics from Mich Michigan University and went straight to the South. He was from the suburban Chicago area outside of excuse me, suburban Chicago area on the Indiana side, near Gary, Indiana. And he went straight to the south and decided I'm going to serve my people when he could have had other opportunities. Tuskegee didn't have a whole lot of money. They gave him a house and a small stipend check every week. And he was satisfied. Tuskegee didn't have a whole lot of resources either to buy books. You know, a kid today goes, the general thing is you go and go to the bookstore and buy your books for the semester. Generally speaking, you rented a book because you couldn't keep it in that they didn't have enough. So they would just, you'd use it for that semester and then you'd have to hand it down to somebody else. My uh, grandfather was in charge of the math department and um, in 1946, 47, 48, they didn't have any money to buy a math book. So they said, Joe, can you please write one? This is it. Looks almost 80 years old. It's one of, it's one of the more valuable possessions I've got. And I'm proud of my grandfather. If you look at the pages, he didn't, he didn't have a printer. It's all with a typewriter. And a, a ruler and a pencil where he'd do graphs and he'd try to make them symmetrical. Everything was by hand. I called Tuskegee um, oh, about six months ago. And uh, I said, listen, my, my name is Brett. I'm the grandson of Joe Fuller. They said, you got to be kidding me. I said, no. I said, um, I, got, I got one of my grand, grandpa's books. I want to know in your library, do you have any? And they have 10. But they're in the archives. Of course, nobody uses them. I mean, sooner or later, they got some money from the government, and they were able to buy math books for everybody. But this was it for 46, 47, and 48. I said, how can I get those books, please? I got seven kids, and I got a brother and sister. I need every one of them. You won't use them ever again. They only mean something to me. He said, I don't know. They're part of our archives. I said, how much do you want? <laughs> what donation do I have to give to the school? So I'm working it. I'm working it. As proud as I am of my grandfather. I lament that he had to do this. <laughs> that the students that went to Tuskegee went there because they were trying to get ahead and they had no money and neither did the school. 
I lament what my grandfather had to go through. We'd go down there and spend every summer. My mother got her, her master's degree in the 70s down there. We were from Kansas City. and We'd go down and she'd do her studies at Tuskegee, then Institute, now University. And we'd stay at my grandfather's home for eight weeks. Oh, it was just great, just great. We had so enjoyed the South. And being with my grandparents was phenomenal. And I'd watch my grandfather and he was my hero. He'd take us on trips to Disney World and we went on cruises and he saved his money. He, he was the president of the savings and loan in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama. Uh, he was good with numbers. And um, <clears throat> he saved his money really well. And he would take us on vacation places, in Callaway Gardens in Georgia and Six Flags over Georgia. And we'd go down to Disney World. And, and it was just, just the best. Four or five summers in a row. And I'd watch him move around in the city and specifically how he carried himself every day. And uh, there wasn't a day when he walked out of the house that he didn't wear a bow tie. <laughs> now you know. Now you know. I do it in honor of my grandfather because he's such a great man. But I lament the fact that he felt, i got to hold it together. But lament works with tears, doesn't it? Yeah. So I, 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 I lament the fact that he actually felt he needed to go out of the house looking in such a way that whenever, if he were to come in contact with a white man, a white man would respect him. Never saw him in shorts and a t-shirt, ever. When he mowed the grass, when he mowed the grass, trousers and a button-down shirt, long sleeve. Sometimes I saw him doing it in a bow tie. Why? Because he would never be seen as somebody who others would believe was not worthy of respect. That's how he had to present himself in the South regularly. I lament the fact that he couldn't wear shorts while he was cutting the grass. I lament the fact that my dad felt that the best option for us was to move from Kansas City in the inner city to white suburbia. That our neighborhood was so dangerous that he felt that the best option was to put his family in a place of danger. Pick your poison. There was a friend of mine also named Brett. We had like birthdays, three months apart. We went to Kitty College together, which is preschool. He was five doors up from me. I mean, we were best friends. We looked like one another. His dad was a police officer. And uh, Brett had a friend over who was my age one day, and his dad unfortunately left a revolver out on the coffee table, loaded. His son picked it up played with it, accidentally shot his friend, killed him. That day, my dad said, we're gone. That could have been my boy. A few months later, we purchased a house in Leewood, Kansas, white suburbia. And my life was no fun. I didn't know how to articulate it. I didn't know how to say it. But everything on the inside of me wanted to say, you actually believed moving here was safer? This was, be this was your best idea of better. We broke the color barrier in our neighborhood. Obviously, I did in my elementary school. I didn't have friends for a couple of years. I got called everything but my first name. I had this angel, though. I say that figuratively. My first grade teacher was Mrs. Haig. And she came by every week to give my mother a progress report as to how I was doing. I mean, came by my house. I thought that's what first grade teachers did. <laughs> I didn't know. She just showed up every week. And she would sit there and tell my mom, this is how Brett's doing. And I'd listen, and she was right. I didn't have any friends. He seems to be kind of lonely. But I thought... 
gosh, this woman cares about me. I lament the fact that a teacher had to come to my house to give my mother a progress report on the condition of her son because she was concerned. I'm grateful to God for her. But that was the environment in which I grew up. My dad wanted us to uh, be like every other kid and swim in the, the swimming pools, you know, community pools. And there was a country club called Johnson County Country Club, or Leewood Country Club. And he said, I want, I want to join. They said, ain't no way. He said, you won't, you won't let us be a part? Nope. So the next week, my dad called the swimming pool company, and within seven days, there was a bulldozer in my backyard. We were the first house in the hood, the white hood, to have a swimming pool. I love my daddy. <laughs> my, daddy was, my daddy was a bad man. He was a bad man. We had to pay more for the house than it was worth because no realtor would sell to us. So we had to buy from an individual owner, and that individual owner knew, you want to live here? Okay. I lament that my dad had to pay more just to keep his kids safe. We loved our pool, but I sure would have liked to have swum with my friends. An African-American lives with this on the inside. That every day he walks out of his house, he knows he's black. Not just by the sense of pride from his heritage, but because he has to be self-aware. He cannot let his guard down. Generally speaking, white folks never have to remember they're white. I got to go into Nordstrom's, I remember I'm black. I go into the grocery store, I got to remember I'm black. I know that those cameras that are watching... Whoever's watching them, generally, if they're white, are watching me more than they're watching anybody else. Every place I go, I have to remember, be aware, I am black. I lament that I just can't be. I lament. And I could go on and on and on. But my God gives me great hope every day in the midst of my lamenting that doesn't allow my feelings and my disappointment with what is not to color my, my idea of what can be. I have great hope. Are you listening to me? I live in hope every day. Getting up believing that our world somehow or another through the difficulty is actually going to be made better as people who love God insert themselves intentionally into very difficult environments with the right kind of a solution. And you would be so proud of your staff and the people who have embraced who we are. We are made for a moment like this. That's why we concentrate on building like this. Listen. Every church growth expert, every church growth book told me, don't build this. Do not build multiculturally. Don't build multi-ethnically. There are too many undercurrents that get in the way and everybody has different expectations. You will never build a large church like that. It will be an impediment to size. You'll stay small. I said, well, small it will be, but I ain't changing And I believe my God can fix the stuff that you think is an impediment to growth if I build according to his plan. Amen. Simply because it hasn't been done well doesn't mean it can't be done. Amen. This guy had never seen it. Church growth books had never experienced it. Amen. And by the grace of God, we have what we have. Amen. And because we have what we have, we have a lot to say. Businesses are calling us up and say, my employees are at one another's throats. I don't know what to do. They're calling our church and say, can you help me? 
They're not asking us to preach the gospel. <laughs> but they're going to get it. <laughs> At some level, they're going to get the truth that comes from the Bible. But they are asking, can you help me? Because I don't know what to do. And I'm not exaggerating, literally. They're calling people and saying, help us. And we say, sure. There are other pastors who... I. I've been on so many Zoom calls. All, all of us. Have, I, 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 I can't wait till I don't have to do Zoom anymore. All of us have been on that. But I have been on so many Zoom calls with pastors, helping them, mostly white, some black who are trying to figure out how in the world can I stop being so mad? Because it's bleeding over into my congregation, and it doesn't. It's a mixture of hope and bitterness. Those two things don't work together. How can I? How can I get delivered of this so I can be a pure stream? But the white pastors are saying, I'm saying stupid stuff. Uh, people are describing me as a racist, but I really, what I'm about to say even sounds stupid. I love you, Brett. I said, well, it is stupid, but let me help you. I know what you're trying to say. I know what you mean, but let me tell you why that doesn't work. Every time you say you have a black friend, it doesn't give any cred credibility to me because they may be tolerating you just like I am. Let me help you with your vernacular. And then I give them history. And then I give them what, what they shouldn't do and how they need to respond to some of their African-American members who are crying foul all the time. You're insensitive. You don't know what you're doing. And finally, the first thing the pastor is saying to the African-American members in the church is, you're right. I'm an idiot. I don't know. I have no idea what to, no idea what to say. I have no idea what to do. Help me. I said, great. You're in a good spot now. We are helping so many. I got off a call today with the, the NCAA coaches of basketball. I was counseling them about how in the world they can help their environment. And, and it, it was just supposed to be a consulting moment. No Bible, just truth. And at the end of it, they said, would you please serve in our committee? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then one of my best friends is on the call. And I, I ignored the invitation. You have no idea how busy I am. I ignored the invitation and went on to something else. He said, uh, Pastor Brett, would you please respond to the invite? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Yes. The football team here in the area. I'm working with them. I can't tell you how much. I can't tell you how much. We're actually making a difference. And it's not, it's not just me. It's not just me. There are members. I got an email from a guy who said there's a person who said something really, really unwise on their Facebook page. And now they're in danger of being fired. And they heard about it, and the person reached out to them with the Facebook post, and the person in our church responded back and said, that wasn't a wise Facebook post at all. You really are, are, are way off. They then repented of their being way off. We're not quite sure whether they repented because they were about to be fired or whether they really knew, <laughs> really knew they were wrong. In either case, contrition came. And they said, could you... Could you, like, be, a, be an advocate for me to my boss? <laughs> the person then emailed me and said, what do I do with this? I said, welcome to peacemaking. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to peacemaking. I said, we get to develop solutions that take an adversary to the place of being an ally and then hopefully to be becoming an advocate. That's what I live for. That's why I'm here. That's what God does for us. We were adversaries. He made us family, allies. And then he makes us agents of reconciliation. Our job is to go out and be representatives of him to the world. That's what I'm trying to do with everybody. I said, listen, this is what peacemaking is. You're figuring out how to stand between both when they beat you up. Because they both think you're for the other person. And then 
the end product that they both submit is better off on both sides than they ever could be individually. And then the kingdom is advanced. And this is why Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. All the other wonderful blessings in the Beatitudes, they're good. They're fabulous. Blessed are the merciful. You get mercy. Woo-hoo. Everybody needs that. Blessed are those who, 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 who have a, 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 a poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the meek because they get to inherit the earth. Those are all wonderful blessings, but nothing is like the one that comes from being a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemaker for they are the sons of God. You get a new name plate on your door. You don't just get a blessing that is heaven and, and kingdom oriented. You get a new name. It doesn't mean you get born again. It means you get recognized differently. You identify with what Jesus did in being the one who made peace and stand between both and getting beat up by both. Suffering our, our stuff, our pain from the Father, all judgment fell on him that should have been ours, and then being beat up by man. And because of his standing in the middle, we are all free. Peace was made. I said, this is what it means to be a peacemaker. We're making a difference because we're made for this. You're made for this. Black person doesn't mean that we color code it. We whitewash it. We sugarcoat it so that it feels a whole lot better to the dominant population. It simply means that we are interested in including the dominant population into our world by inserting truth, understanding, and compassion that takes a person that might be an adversary to being an ally and now an advocate. White folks, how you start a conversation? I hope you listened the other day. Number one, I feel your pain, though I will never understand it. You will never understand it. But empathy is important. Number two, I am sorry for what people who look like me have done to people who look like you. Identification. Even though you may not have done it, you identify with people who have. Three, what can I do to help? Those three statements are not the healing statements that make everything all right. They build the on-ramp to a conversation that helps to begin the process of making things right. If we have black folks that are interested in holding the conversation, that are not so offended that they can't at least discuss, and we have white folks that come with an attitude of humility, peace can can be brokered. And real reconciliation can happen. We're made for this. And so, as I close, Jeremiah said, even though my life has been a wreck and you've been heavy on me and my city is destroyed, I know one thing is true. The steadfast love. He says he remembered this after he had gone through his entire lamentation for the past three, three, three and a half chapters, he says, and then I remembered, as difficult as my life has been, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And his mercies never come to an end. How often are they new? Say it again. They are new every morning. And... What, how did he describe his faithfulness? Great. Great is your faithfulness. Through the midst of my difficulty, the one thing I can hold on to that brings me sanity, Jeremiah says, is the fact that every morning you greet me with your kindness and your faithfulness sustains me all day long. That's why you don't hear me on a regular basis, bleeding through my words because I hold on to the steadfast love of the Lord and his mercy that has sustained me every day of my life. I don't know what your pain is. That's mine. Deal with it like that. And watch what God will do for you. Let's pray. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your goodness and grace. Help us all to take our laments to you on a regular basis. 
and to come out of your presence better than when we came in. Is there anybody this evening who has yet to give their heart to Christ? Maybe you've made a decision in the past, but your life doesn't look anything like what a Christian's ought to be, and you fit in one of those two categories. Just raise your hand high here in the sanctuary or if you're online. Raise your hand high. God wants to help you today. Anybody? I see that hand. Bless you. Once it's up, you can put it down. Gosh, I haven't said that in 15 weeks. You who raised your hand both online and in the sanctuary, pray with me. Say, Father in heaven, forgive me. I am sorry for the way I've lived. I choose to turn away from everything I know to be sin and to follow you with all of my heart. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for giving me the privilege of calling Jesus the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, go ahead and click that little box at the bottom saying, I raised my hand. And then another box will show up that allows you to connect with somebody who can help you. If you prayed it here, please find somebody after the service and connect with them out at the information desk and they will give you some literature and connect you with someone who can pass you through the decision you made and help you. If you need prayer, go to the top of the chat box, check that and somebody will contact you so that prayer can be given on your behalf to God.